speaker, uh, Mr. Deepak Gewali, uh, because he has a fantastic experience as a hydrologist and understands the movement of water, but he is a rare bridge between the science of hydrology and of um, the water in terms of he is the former minister of water resources of Nepal, but he always brings in what it is that the local community understands, how people make decisions, how they interact with the environment and water. So it is a special honor for us to have him come uh, from Nepal to share his experiences uh, over decades of managing uh, water there. Uh, Deepak, the floor thank is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, let me begin by sharing my uh, screen. Uh, so it's on three parts. First, the reality check, then the cautionary reassessment. And finally, I'll talk about this ethical uh, responsibility. Now, uh, when we talk ethics, uh, we are actually talking about our actions and our reflection on our actions. Okay. Um, it comes back to this old, uh, much misused or misunderstood uh, Hindu Buddhist term karma. Karma is action and also taking responsibility for your action. Uh, it's not just fatalism. Okay. Now, when we do this, the first thing we've got to understand is from the perspective of the people who live there, uh, who are taking actions, and then finally about the people from the outside uh, who bring in something else that uh, changes aspirations and things like that in the Himalaya. Now, the most important point, this picture that I have in front of you, it's a typical uh, mountain setting in Nepal between 1500 to 2000, 2300 meters, uh, the mid hills of Nepal, uh, which do not get snow, or if it gets snow at all in winter, it's a day or two and it melts away fast. It's mostly all rain, both the monsoon and the um, winter westerlies. And these are where the, most of the people live. They do not live in the high snow Arctic regions. And this is where most of the population is. Okay, And this is where most of the environmental concerns, everyday concerns are being faced. Now, one big problem here is the drudgery of life. If you have a spring down below where I, uh, I, I show you, and you have a village up here, it's about an hour, two hours, or three hours of climbing, uh, carrying water every day. It's a very laborious drudgery uh, that people want to be free of. Now, what this has done in that search is suddenly a kind of a miracle has arrived in the form of new technologies, uh, cars and roads, uh, electric pumps, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, the problem here is that, um, is that uh, old technologies, whether it was carrying water uh, by yourselves or mules or whatever you use them, uh, or transport, they had uh, some kind of social control over the technologies that weaved in the ethical concerns, the larger societal concerns about the social good, the overall social good. What these new technologies have done is they have come in without those social contr controls. I call them runaway technologies. They are very seductive, don't get me wrong. Okay, And once they come in, uh, we do not have either the state or the community groups or the traditional you know, clan social relationships able to control those technologies. The result is, uh, in consequences, there's massive over pumping. There's very bad road building uh, that is adding to the destruction of the, uh, of the, of, of the springs. Okay? And this is essentially what uh, you are having. Every one of the Mid Hill Mountains is actually a water tower. It's not just the ice, you know, glaciers up there, that's the water tower in the Himalaya. Every one of them has water inside and they leak. They leak in springs. And we have different types of springs, okay? Permanent springs, July springs, August springs, not all of them come to life all the time. Permanent springs are mostly permanent, okay? Uh, depending on the rainfall, it depends on how much the mountain fills up with water. And 
if the Jul August spring comes to life, there is a saying among the people that the winter uh, spring harvest is going to be good because there's enough water in the mountains that leak into streams from which they irrigate their fields. Okay. Now, what is happening with the misuse of technology uh, and the changing lifestyle is uh, that uh, uh, we are over pumping. Okay. Before you carried waters, if you needed six pots, you carried six pots, you didn't carry seven. Okay. And there was a social constraint on that in the concept of stale water, which you could not use for cooking rice or uh, in religious offerings. Okay. It was impure. So you didn't carry extra water. To now with electric pumping and uh, solar pumping even, uh, there's a tendency with PVC pipes to just pump away to glory. Now, once there is an over pumping in one set of springs, especially in the foothills, the whole mountain water tower dries up and other springs dry up. As a result, one of the, there's a cancer across the Himalaya. Now you see that reference below. We worked, we've been working for the last almost decade now with Isimod and Pema, I'm sure, is going to have a lot of things to say on this, uh, on the drying up of springs across Himalaya. It's not just Nepal. It's in Uttarakhand, Himachal in India. It is in, you know, Sikkim, Arunachal, you know, on uh, Bhutan too, I dare say, although Bhutan is doing a far better job than most of us. And there is uh, also because of labor out migration, the traditional ponds are being just filled up. Uh, there's a decline in livestock keeping, which means buffalo wallowing ponds are being dried up. And as a result, uh, even less water is going in. Yes, climate change is important. Uh, we do not know exactly, as uh, Joseph, the previous speaker said, exactly what it is, but we have an inkling that extreme events are going to be more, more frequent and uh, uh, more uh, erratic. Uh, and what they will do to recharge is something. Climate change is going to make it worse. But my concern here is that there are other social drivers that we have created that is leading to this drying up of springs. Climate change is going to make it worse. But if we don't address our here and our drivers that is leading to this maldevelopment, uh, we are not going to be solving the problem. So this is just an example of our, you know, trying to get to a revival of those, you know, spring recharge ponds in the hills. <coughs> it's a very small effort, uh, but uh, it requires really mass scale work. And we are still trying to convince our governments to do this. Okay. Now, if you look at the bad technologies, what you see is this on the left side. There's a Nepali village expression called dozer atanka or bulldozer terrorism. Okay. This is the kind of, you know, people want access to roads. They want access to modern vehicles and all that. It is not something you can deny them. In fact, it's being argued even on human rights grounds, this access to remote villages where people previously walked seven days to get to anywhere. Now they want road access. The trouble is it's being done very haphazardly. It is leading to massive environmental degradation, you know, and uh, uh, the more serious part is there are alternative technologies, proven technologies like the ropeway technology, which has a lower environmental footprint, much, much lower environmental damage footprint. And you can see from the figures I have up there that it uses only half the energy and that to hydropower, unlike fossil fuel in roads. It uses half the energy to transport the same amount of goods in the mountains. So it's a mountain friendly and climate friendly technology. It has been in Nepal for the last hundred years. 1924 was when the first ropeway was installed. It's 2021, almost a hundred years now. Okay. But this technology has not taken off. There's a hegemony of the other technologies, the road technology, the fossil fuel burning technology, which is really contributing uh, a lot uh, to this uh, damage. Okay. Now, the question I ask is, why is this? Despite all the campaigns, despite the obvious benefits, a technology is marginalized and a bad technology is hegemonic. And once it is so hegemonic, there is a lock-in. You you, we, we are in a technological lock-in with these technologies. Okay? Now, you also have another phenomenon going on. And this is being talked about recently with this, what is called sand mining globally. Okay? But, and there have been some really interesting articles that this is a really scarce resource that uh, is destroying our planet, the mining of it. But in Nepal, it's even worse because it's not just cyan mining, as we call it riverbed mining of aggregates and all, you know, the result of which is that the water tables are also declining in the hills as well as in the plains below. Okay. Uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the decline in, in fish abundance leading to families which survived on fishing now massively having to out-migrate for labor, uh, you know, instead of raising fish and buffaloes in Nepal, uh, you know, uh, herding camels in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, for, for wage labor. And this is contributing essentially to, uh, to uh, a massive social destruction uh, along the way, environmental destruction and social destruction. Now, what my concern is, now I talked about those living inside and where are we need to address these wrong drivers. There's also people outside. And by that, I mean development agencies, the banks that fund development, which are not funding the right kind of technologies, but are funding the uh, technologies that allow pushing of large scale capital through. Okay? Uh, and the development agencies are as guilty over the last 50 years as anyone else. Okay? So what I would talk about with ethical responsibility, and this is my closing slide, is that I argue that you know, ethical responsibility lies in our reflecting on the, our karma, our action. Karma is to act okay? in Sanskrit. Now, uh, we have to reflect on our uh, consequences of our actions, both our mental and emotional aspirations for development, for uh, getting rid of drudgery and all that. Okay? And at the same time, we also have to reflect on the harmful consequences they have given rise to. So it is not just uh, actions we have taken in the past. It's also actions we are contemplating taking in the future. Okay? This is where ethics essentially comes in. Okay? So to me, this essentially comes to the whole question of rethinking development. The last 50, 60 years of development that we have practiced has led to unintended or you know, unforeseen consequences that have been devastating, both to the environment and to society at large, especially the weakest and most marginalized of our societies. And so therefore, the, the two areas that we need to immediately rethink is the consequences of technologies, their aptness or malfeasance, okay? And what are the kind of technologies that we should be promoting and what are the kind of technologies that should be heavily taxed, mar you know, gotten rid of eventually and so on, okay? And we also have to go seriously into evaluating, re-evaluating, rethinking the role uh, of the social carriers of those technologies. I talked about bulldozer terrorism, dozer atanka, now, what is terrible in Nepal right now, and you probably have you know, heard about the political implosion going on right now amid a COVID crisis. Uh, there's a Nepali expression, Galganamati uh, Khatiro. What basically it means is a goiter, you know, a boil on top of a goiter. That's what we're going through in Nepal. Uh, in, on top of the COVID, we have a political implosion where essentially there is no government. Now, problem is that those, you know, the, the, the carriers of those bulldozer terrorism technologies also own political parties. And while we talk of democracy, our first speaker talked about democracy, it's essential to go back to the political economy of capital, political economy of technologies, the social carriers of technologies, uh, the agencies that fund those technologies and those social carriers, and reflect on that to find an alternative development pathway. And this is what I believe the Club of Rome started way in the what 60s or 70s, uh, but which got marginalized during the 90s with the Washington consensus and the collapse of the Soviet Union to go the way of all capital, the way of market, all market, by marginalizing society and societal ethical concerns. This is where we have to go back to with a vengeance, I might add. Thank you. <laughs>